College of Engineering Capstone Design Symposium. I'm Dr. Bill Kissler. I was teaching uh, PE 421 this semester. We have several distinguished guests. We've got uh, Dr. Ashworth in the back. Distinguished? Here he is. Yes, that's you. I'll tell him about you someday. Bryce Milnes was one of my program managers last year. He's coming in from the F35 program at Edwards. Bill Zwick, you know, he's a professor in the class. You have a new friend. Doug Streeter. Hey Doug, glad you're here. Hey, uh, I work right now on uh, mechanical design, uh, missiles and other things. This will be a lot of fun. My <laughs> friend Scott Wells, we worked together at the Air Force Academy for a long time. We've known each other for a while. He works uh, guidance control down at uh, Raytheon. Works in a vault all day. Jeff Jansen works at Honeywell. It's on the engine systems and, and auxiliary power units, that sort of thing. And Steve is from Armstrong, used to be Dryden, out at Edwards, this flight test. And this is my, my good friend, Wally Morris. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I don't have to sneak out today. <laughs> and let me introduce uh, the program manager for this semester, Kyle Wimmer. He's going to introduce the rest of his team. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is the detailed design review for Stratus Business Jets. We're going to briefly go over our team. Um, as Dr. Chrysler said, my name is Kyle Wimmer. I'm the program manager this semester. Over on the side, we have Tatiana Toriani, our chief engineer this semester, Gong Hee Kim, Cody Johnson, August Gearing, Johnny Perry, Blaze Golden, Ian Lai, Mohammed Al Jahadi, and Sho Okiyam. So this semester, we we're broken out into four IPTs, integrated project teams. Uh, we had Cody Johnson leading our wind tunnel testing. We had Blaze Golden leading our structures analysis. Johnny Perry leading our editorial. And Sho Okiyama leading our fabrication. So Stratus Business Jets elected to participate in the AIAA undergraduate <coughs> design competition. This year, the request for proposal called for a family of light business jets, a six and eight passenger compliant with FAR Part 23 and 25 regulations respectively, with an entry into service in 2022 for the six passenger aircraft and 2020 for the eight passenger aircraft. These aircraft have to maintain a 70% weight commonality to help decrease the production cost. And here you can see some of the performance requirements. The key one being the 2,500 nautical mile range and this basically allows us to take off anywhere in the U.S. and fly coast to coast. As you can see from our range map, taking off in Seattle or San Diego allows us to still reach anywhere all the way past Maine. Our cruise, max cruise Mach number is set at 0.85 and a service ceiling of 45,000 feet with our takeoff and landing conditions uh, 4,000 feet for balance field length and 3,600 feet for landing. This is our mission diagram with some of the key Values noted are takeoff distance for both aircraft just under the requirement of 4,000 feet. Our climb, we're expecting about 60 nautical miles in the climb phase to be covered. Our cruise distance at 2,460 nautical miles, and this is done at a max or at a Mach number of 0.82 at 35,000 feet. This yields us a cruise time of just over five and a quarter, or just under five and a quarter out. Um, we're not crediting any distance in descent, and then we also have the FAA required 45 minute reserve, as well as the NBAA 100 nautical mile um, alternate. Our landing distances, again, well below our requirement of 3,600 feet. Next, I'll pass it off to Tatiana for our conceptual design approach. Thank you, Kat. Um, to be noted is that due to our strict design range requirements, we had to choose a traditional low risk design with a high fuel fraction in order to minimize drag. This is the constraint analysis for the RAS-8. As you can see, we pushed our design plank down to the right, just above the takeoff line, in order to yield a conservative design. This yielded a thrust to weight of about 0.41 and a wing loading of about 61 pounds per square feet. The same was done for the RAS-6 where a thrust to weight of 0.43 and a wing loading of 57 pounds per square feet was estimated. This is a free view of the RAS-8. As you can see, it has a wingspan of about 51 feet and an overall length of about 59 feet. The overall height is at 17 feet and this is common with the RAS-6 due to a common empennage and landing gear design. This is a free view of the RAS-6. The 
wingspan of the RAS 6 is a little bit shorter at about 48 feet, and the overall length is also shorter at about 55 feet due to a decreased fuselage size or length. Now I'll hand it off to Gummy for weight and balance. So we estimate our component weight of RS8 and S6 by using the last constant effort that they are listed here. By using that, we have our estimate F weight of about 11,100 pounds for S8 and 10,000 pounds for S6. For the takeoff weight, we use uh, estimate the fuel weight and check the fuel weight all the way from performance analysis and last constant percent of the simulation method. And we also use our payload and crew weight from our P. I think that our P have takeoff weight of about 19,900 pounds for either S8 and 18,100 pounds for S6. To validate more than 70% commonality requirement, we compare both airplane and group by group. We, decide, we decided which component or equipment in each group can be, can be used in both airplane. So as a result, we had a 70% and 76% of commonality relative to each other. We also conducted CG analysis based on two flight conditions, which are long range crews and maximum payload. This is our CG diagram for other SA with long range crews. It has two seating configuration with the flow ground uh, It has CG, it has a possible CG, possible CG range of about nine inches. This is our maximum payload case for RS8, and it has a CG range of about 6 inches. And this is CG diagram for RS6 with long range cruise condition. It has the same format as RS8, and the possible over CG range is about 5 inches. And this is our maximum payload case for RS6. It has two loads with a different number of crews. And the overall CG range in this case is about six inches. Now I will hand over to Carl for L and Thanks, Carl. The first decision we had to make was what airfoil we were going to use. We elected to use a NASA supercritical, specifically the SE2-0410. This yielded us a 2D critical Mach number of 0.78. This is a airfoil with 10% thick camber thickness and 1% camber producing a CL max of just under 1.5 and a CL alpha of 0.122. The profile can be seen in the top right photo of this airflow, as well as the 2D CL versus angle of attack data. Using the wing area found from our constraint analysis and the airfoil we selected, we were able to begin designing the wing. As Tatiana mentioned, the wingspan is around 51 feet for the Aria S8 and the S6 just around 47 with the clipping of the wings. And this was to help maintain our parts commonality between, between the two wings, but adjust for our different uh, wing loading from the constraint analysis. This in, in, sorry, this in combination with the, port, the root port and tip port yielded us an aspect ratio of 7.8 for the Aria S8 and 7.1 for the Aria S6. Both wings have an Oswald's efficiency just under 0.7. Uh, we do not have any incidents on the wing when it's attached to the body, but we do have two degrees of geometrical twist starting here at the production brakes on both wings and spanning outwards towards the tip. And this is to help us with roll control and high angle of attack scenarios. We did sweep the leading edge 29 degrees, and this was to help increase our 2D critical Mach number from 0.78 to 2.8. Our aircraft is equipped with select flaps, and this allows us to reach those higher CLs for takeoff and landing. We started by looking at comparable aircraft for their flap sizing and then adjusted to what we needed specifically for ours. This yielded us a flap to wing cord ratio of about 20% and a span ratio of around 50% for both aircraft. As you can see, that nests us nicely within comparable aircraft. And down in the bottom right, you can see a photo of the flap location on one of our wings. Using the geometry from our wing, as well as the 2D data, we were able to use Grant's method to transform the 2D data to 3D data. And this yielded us the following um, CL versus angle of attack plots. Our desired takeoff condition with 15 degrees of flaps, we were running a CL of 1.1, which is below our CL max and just outside of the stall regime. The crews were expecting a CL less than 0.25, which is well below the clean wing configuration's CL max. 
and the landing with 35 degrees of flaps, a desired CL of 1.3, again below the CL max and out of the stall regime. The same was done for the Aria S6. The same desired CLs were used for takeoff and landing at 1.1 and 1.3, again below our maximum and out of our stall regime. However, due to the decrease in weight, the cruise CL was decreased down to about 0.23, which is still well below our clean wing CL max. Using a component drag buildup method, we were able to investigate the CD0 for the aircraft through various flight phases. Takeoff, long range cruise condition at Mach 0.82, maximum cruise Mach at 0.85, and our landing condition. These values can be seen from both aircraft in the table on the left. We also looked at how our CD0 varies with Mach number. As you can see, as we increase our Mach number, our CD0 does decrease until we hit our critical Mach number of around 0.8 for the wing. At that point, we start to see the effects of transonic wave drag kick in. It slightly increases until about Mach 0.82, and then we see a real rapid increase. For that reason, our long-range cruise condition um, Mach number was chosen at 0.82 to minimize our, trade and drag, or our wave, transonic wave drag, but maximize our cruise velocity. Using the CD0, we were able to calculate the drag puller for the aircraft. This yielded us a best L over D at takeoff of 8.5, at long range cruise condition 14.5, and at landing of 5. The drag bullet can be seen here on the right. The same was done for the Aria S6. The best L over D did decrease slightly due to the change in the wing geometry. Um, best L over D at 8.7 for takeoff, long range cruise condition 13.9, and our max or landing at just under 5. We did also look at our maximum L over D at various altitudes for endurance. Uh, at sea level, we get a max L over D around Mach 0.3, at 35,000 feet around Mach 0.54, and 45,000 feet around Mach 0.7. Now, we do not expect to be doing much endurance flight as our mission is to go 2,500 nautical miles in a reasonable amount of time. For that reason, our cruise condition is still set at 0.82, and we will take the, the decrease in L over D. The same was done for the RES-6. Slight decrease at sea level to Mach 0.28, but the 35,000, 45,000 feet condition remained fairly constant due to the similarities between the aircraft. Being that we do cruise at a high subsonic Mach number, we did investigate area of ruling of both aircraft. The dash blue line here is of the ideal Sears hatch body. As you can see, we are far from that. Uh, the double bunk created by the wings and the engine and the cells it's just a price that we pay for this configuration of aircraft, and there's not a whole lot that we can do to really improve that without pinching the tail cone and doing some adjusting. Um, we chose not to do that due to the cost associated with manufacturing on that. The same was done for the Aria S6. There was a slight decrease in that maximum cross-section area. That's just due to the shortening of the wing, shortening of the fuselage. But we still do have the double bump as Next, I'm going to pass it off to Cody to talk about our wind tunnel test. Thank you, Kat. Our wind tunnel testing was divided into three sections. The first section was a component buildup method, where we would take components of the aircraft and find their individual drag values. The next method was an angle of attack sweep, where we would be able to validate our lift predictions. And the last section was a flow visualization, where we would identify areas of separation as well as potential flow anomalies with a tufted aircraft. Here you can see a CAD drawing of our model. Due to limitations in the test section, we could only have a 120th scale model. This gave us a Reynolds number of 141,000 compared to our full scale Reynolds number of 14 million. We designed the model to be modulated. This would help us with manufacturing as well as allow us to do that drag component buildup method for our drag values. Our model was made out of ABS plastic and printed in the rapid prototype labs here on campus. We gave it some steel supports to strengthen that plastic, and then we interfaced with the balance using an aluminum mount. Here you can see our results of a CL alpha with our angle of attack speed. We went from negative 5 degrees to positive 12. This would encapsulate full stall and then our negative angle of attack bounds. 
Our CL alpha values between our theoretical and experimental values are pretty close with less than 5% error. So we thought that validated our lift predictions. We were not able to replicate that stall regime up at the top, uh, but this is because our aircraft is a super, uses a supercritical airfoil. And we were operating at Reynolds numbers, which supercritical airfoils are not very efficient at. We also wanted to validate our drag model, so we did the drag component buildup method. You can see here that the process results are significantly lower than what we had predicted. Our minimum CD values in the wind tunnel were not nearly as high. We were able to match what we got in the wind tunnel, but we had to modify our interference values. We decided to stick with our theoretical models instead of the uh, process results because they are more conservative. And with those more conservative drag values, we were still able to meet our range requirements. One of our theories for why the drag values were so much lower was we were predicting we would get a lot more separation drag off of the fuselage at high angle of attack. However, in the figure here, you can see that our fuselage still experienced attached flow even beyond our uh, stalling mode attack. And then I'll talk about our tufting a little bit more in stability and control. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about stability and control. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an animation of all of our control surfaces in blue. Our flaps deploy that or deflect to 30 degrees. You can see our ailerons demonstrating a roll maneuver, and our rudder and elevator demonstrating yaw and pitch. Our empennage was designed with a T-tail configuration. This would push our horizontal tail plane out of any potential interference due to the engine or the wing, and would allow us to have the maximum possible effective area of our vertical tail plane. From last semester, we reduced the leading edge sweep of our vertical tail plane. This pushed our uh, horizontal tail plane a little bit forward, which reduced our static margin and uh, moved our aerodynamic center forward. Uh, I mentioned that we'll talk about tufting a little bit more here. As you can see, even at high angles of attack, our control surfaces still experience attached flow, which validates our T-tail configuration. Our elevators were sized compared to our comparables. We started out with an average from there, and then we iterated through until our design can, uh, it went towards the convergence point for our aircraft. Here you can see our final sizing compared to our comparables. We still messed in there pretty well. We validated that our elevator was properly sized by ensuring we could pitch for takeoff. You can see here, that we are able to pitch to our uh, rotation angle of 8 degrees with only 30 or 28 degrees of deflection. We sized our rudder similarly. We started with our comparable aircraft and then iterated through until our design converged on our aircraft. You can see our final sizing here with our comparables. We are still within a nominal range. Our rudder size was validated by making sure we were still in compliance with FAR Part 23 and 25. We had to be able to operate in an engine out scenario as well as compensate for a 25 knot crosswind landing. Be because our engines are so close to the center line of the aircraft, it was not very difficult to satisfy the engine out requirement. However, the 25 knot requirement was a little harder. We were able to satisfy that requirement with 38 and 36 degrees of rudder deflection. To ensure that our ailerons were properly sized, we also had to be in compliance with FAR Part 23 and 25. We had to be able to bank from negative 30 degrees to 30 degrees in less than 10 seconds. We were able to bank that 60 degrees in less than 10 seconds with 30 degrees of aileron deflection. You can see a uh, picture of our ailerons right there. With our flow visualization, we were able to validate the geometric twist decision of our wing. As you can see here, 
even when the wing has stalled, we still have attached flow going over our ailerons, uh, which validates that geometric twist decision. Our static margin for long range crews is stable. It's a little bit higher than we want, but we have a very small shift in that static margin throughout cruise, uh, which will give us decreased amount of trim drag, which is good for our long range cruise condition. All of our longitudinal stability parameters are within the stable regime, as shown here. And all of our directional and lateral stability parameters are also stable. This will make our aircraft uh, simple to control and allows us to use a simple and inexpensive control system. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Tatiana for propulsion. Thank you, Cody. Due to a conversion design, we were able to use a common propulsion system on both aircraft. We chose the Pratt Mini PW545 um, because of its efficiency and thrust rating. Two variants of the Pratt Whitney engine were chosen. The PW545B was used on the RAS-6 and PW545C for the RAS-8. Since they're the same engine but different variants, they share the same dimensions, which aided in the common nacelle design shared between both aircraft. The nacelle was sized and optimized for crews at 35,000 feet at Mach 0.82. This um, resulted in an additive drag of about 15 pounds which accounts for 1% of losses at an installed thrust of about 1,300 pounds per engine at that cruise condition. We also opted for a clamshell thrust reversing system due to its efficiency and use on comparable aircraft. We estimate that about 60% of throttle thrust can be used for braking upon landing. The APU that was selected was the Honeywell RE100. This is because it is most commonly used on comparable aircraft and is compatible with many engines. <laughs> it is also necessary for engine out bar requirements and it can be customizable for aircraft specific needs. Now I'll give it to August for performance. Thank you. So here we can see the thrust available, thrust required plots for the RAS-8. At uh, sea level condition, the cruise altitude of 35,000 feet, as well as the surface ceiling of 48,500 feet. So at sea level, our initial rate of climb does significantly exceed the RFP requirement of 3,500 feet per minute, as we are able to achieve about a 5,000 foot per minute rate of climb. Additionally, we do meet the 45,000 foot surface ceiling requirement, or 45,000 surface ceiling per foot surface ceiling requirement. Uh, where we are able to achieve a 530 foot per minute climb rate. As I said, that leads to a service ceiling of just under 48,500 feet. So here we have the same, same plot for the RAS-6. Similarly, we do exceed the sea level rate of climb with the ability to achieve about 5,150 feet per minute. Um, also, we, we meet the service ceiling requirement. The service ceiling for the S-6 is a bit higher at just over 48,500 feet. However, for uniformity, the service ceiling of both aircraft has been listed at 48,500. So now we can see the specific excess power envelope for the S8. A couple of things to note, on the right side of the screen, we have the RFP required maximum Mach number of 0 0.85. Uh, as you can see, shown with the red piece of S equals to zero curve, we are able to meet that. Uh, additionally, you can note from that same curve that our absolute ceiling is just under 50,000 feet. One final thing to note, on this one is you can confirm the 5,000 foot per minute climb rate at sea level shown by that takeoff velocity tick mark. Here we have the same piece of S diagram for the ARIA S6. Similarly, we do meet the RFP required Mach 0.85 and our service ceiling, or excuse me, our <coughs> absolute ceiling is just about <coughs> under 50,000 feet. Also, our takeoff uh, initial rate of climb is a bit higher as you can view the same tick mark. Here we have on the left of the screen a payload range diagram for the Aria S8. So at the maximum payload condition, which includes all eight passengers as well as 100 or excuse me, 1,000 pounds of baggage, our range is 1,770 nautical miles. And at the long range cruise condition, which is four passengers and 50 pounds of baggage each, we do meet the, the 2,500 nautical mile range requirement for the range of about, about 2,520 nautical miles. 
So on the right, you can see the relationship between cruise range and cruise Mach number. As Kyle said uh, a few moments ago, we did select Mach 0.82 for the cruise for the cruise number because it falls nicely in the knee of the curve. So that is to say, we were able to maximize the cruise Mach number while minimizing the overall range reduction. Here we have the same two diagrams for the Aria S6. Um, shown in the pain, payload range diagram, the max payload condition, which in this case is six passengers and 500 pounds of baggage, is 1,840 nautical miles. And the long range cruise condition, which is two passengers and 50 pounds of baggage each, is again 2,520 nautical miles, which does exceed the range requirement. Similarly for the S8, the cruise Mach number of 0.82 was selected as it falls nicely in the knee of the curve. Both, of the, both the S8 and the S6 do meet the 4,000 foot balanced field requirement. The S8 comes in just under that at 3,990, whereas the lighter S6 takes just a bit less at 3,870 feet. So here we have the total landing field distance, which, covered, which includes the distance covered through a 50 foot descent. So for the Aria S6, it can land comfortably in 2,860 2, feet, whereas the S6 takes a bit less at 2,610. So finally, just to confirm the performance data that was presented, uh, the tools that were developed by Stratus were compared to published values for our Citation XLS Plus. As you can see in this table, all the values were within about 10%, which gives us reasonable confidence in the, in the characteristics that we presented for, the, for both the S8 and the S6. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Johnny to talk about our structural design. Thanks, August. Uh, on this slide is a structural model of the ARIA S8. Due to the high commonality between the ARIA S8 and the S6, um, in this section, the figures and dimensions will apply to both ARIA S8 and S6. So here is the wing and empanage structure of our aircraft. Our wing includes typical components such as spars, ribs, and stringers. The front spar is located at 15% of the cord, while the aft spar is located at 75% of the cord. We also have a landing gear spar that was required to mount a landing gear to. Um, the ribs are modeled as uh, C channels and are placed every 24 inches. We also have uh, lightning, holes, lightning holes to reduce the overall weight of our aircraft. There are a set of five stringers on the top and the bottom of the wing between the front and aft spar. Um, the spars will be discussed in more detail within the structural analysis section. The horizontal and vertical tail follow a very similar pattern to the main wing. Uh, the only difference is that the ribs on the horizontal and vertical tail are placed every 12 inches. Here are more components of the body of our aircraft. Um, the fuselage contains frames placed every 24 inches. There are also main frames that connect to the spar of our wing. Um, the laundrons occur every 10 degrees around the fuselage, and those, uh, the cross sections of each of those can be seen below here. Our fuselage model also shows the floor supports, window frames, the main cabin door, the emergency exit, and last but not least, window frames for our skylights. The fairing is also on this. Um, that fairing will house our landing gear as well as fuel. And because fuel is being stored in the belly of our aircraft, we needed a keel to increase crash worthiness. The keel, although it's kind of hard to see, will actually wrap up and connect to the appropriate frames within the fuselage. And each of those frames on the frame will actually connect to the fuselage frames as well. Here is a VN diagram of dust loading for the Aria S8 and the Aria S6. The Aria S8 had to be compliant with FAR Part 25 requirements and the RIS-6 had to be compliant with FAR Part 26 requirements. 23, sorry. Um, so uh, both aircraft were analyzed with a max loading of 2.9 Gs. On the left, on the RIS-8, you can see the design, cruise, and dive speed. The RIS-6 also has both of these, as well as the design and gust speed. Overall, both uh, bottles have fairly large envelopes and shouldn't have any structural damage during standard flight. And I'll hand it off to Blaze to talk about structural analysis. Thanks, Johnny. Here we have some of the loads based on the strengths approximation for the Aria S8. On the top, you see the lift distribution. You can notice it is semi elliptical. Based on our lift distribution, the shear force and bending moment 
would then derive, and these loads were used in the further analysis you'll see. So we started off here with the wing, based on hand calculation to develop the number of spars and stringers required, as well as a baseline for the cross section for these components. The model was then semi parametrically designed in ANSYS to quickly vary the cross sections in order to converge on a design. What you see there, the purple, is the wing box model overlay on top of the wing, consists of the structure between the forward and aft spar. So we're noting that the skin was included in these analyses to properly illustrate the shear transfer in the structure of the wing. This model was then fixed at the root to simulate a cantilever beam. And you can see here on the right, the table representing the material properties for these components. The skin being the weakest, so 2024 aluminum, and the spar and ribs both being 7075 of different variants. And you see the corresponding yield strengths for those materials on the far right. Also, the density, modulus elasticity, and Poisson's ratio were assumed constant for the analyses performed. The result for this aircraft, this wing, you can see here the deflection on the left. That deflection is not to scale. It is under max G loading with a factor safety included, which is okay because it's still in the linear region. Our maximum deflection at max G loading is 11.7 inches, and at cruise is about 4 inches. The maximum stress located on our wing, you can see here, is towards the root, represented by the red coloring. The zoom in portion shows the gray. The gray portion represents the elements which were neglected, being that they were located within one element of the boundary condition that was applied. Based on that, the maximum equivalent stress recorded was 51.7 KSI, and based on the yield criteria of 57, a positive margin of safety of 0.083 was achieved. Next, we have the wing attachment. We decided on a three lug design to absorb both the shear and bending loads. You see the center bolted joint absorbing the shear and the top and bottom absorbing the bending. The image in the center shows the resultant loads from those bending elements. The center joint is a pretty large bolt at a half inch in diameter. On the top and bottom, there are five on each side, and they are about 0.3 inches in diameter. The right image shows the mesh model prior to the analysis. So here you see the deflection. Again, this is not to scale, but the largest deflection was very small at 0.035 inches or 3.5 mils. It did occur in the expected location based on the hand calculations performed to come up with the dimensions for the joints. And here you see the stress state. Very similarly, the highest stress occurring where the maximum deflection is, which was expected. The maximum recorded stress for this attachment was 65.4 HSI, and that left us with a margin of safety equal to positive 0.11. The largest concern for our aircraft structure in the wing was the bends located in the spars. You see the first bend called out, that is located in both of the spars forward and aft, and it's near the rear. The second one is located only in the aft and has that production weight. Now, due to these bends being there, a high shot stress concentration, so a stress concentration factor was applied, and the stiffeners that are labeled in the green were added to the blue and gray built up spar to ensure a positive margin of safety. Those stiffeners are added at six inches in each direction from the bend, again, to ensure the margin of safety maintains a positive number. Overall, the analyses performed on these components ensured that the structures met the requirements and safety. Next, Ian will talk about fuel and hydraulics. So, here we have a picture of our Aria S8 with the fuel tanks and fuel system. The Aria S8 will hold about 7,300 pounds of fuel and the Aria S6 will hold about 7,000 pounds of fuel. Both of these numbers in, are include, uh, in, sorry. Both of these numbers include the MBAA requirement of 100, extra 100 nautical miles of, endure, uh, of range and the FAA requirement of 45 minutes of, sorry, sorry, I can't mess it up. The, both of the fuel numbers include um, the FAA requirements of extra 45 minutes of endurance and the MBA requirements of extra 100 nautical miles of range. Um, we have fuel tanks in the wing, the fairing, and the tail tank. But the tail tank is only in the Aria S8. Uh, it is added there to meet the, uh, the proposal requirements for the range. 
from the pipe charts, you can see most of the fuel is held in the wing tanks with a small fraction held in the other tanks. But, um, the fuel tanks and the fuel system are designed to meet FAR requirements for both part 23 and 25. The hydraulic system on board will move the landing gears, the brakes, the thrust reverser, and the pilot assist. Um, in the case of a hydraulic failure, store nitrogen, nitrogen tanks near each of the landing gears will activate and blow out the landing gears and lock them in for a safe landing. Next, Mohammed will talk about the landing gears. Thank you. As you can see, for the weight distribution of the landing gear, used about 10% on the nose gear and 90% on the main gear, and that's to maintain a minimum of 8% of the weight on the nose gear to allow steering on the ground. Since the S8 is the, is the larger aircraft, the wheel pace is a 25 feet for, for it and 21 for the S6, and that is and, and, and that is uh, the distance between the main gear and the nose gear. However, to keep the commonality, 70% uh, commonality between the two aircraft, the wheel track, which is the distance between the two main gear in the back, is 8.48. Our both aircraft have met all the ground parameters. The dip over angle is 63 degree for both of them. The, S, the RAS-8, has a larger tip back angle and that is due to the heavier weight. In the tail strike angle, the Aria S6 has a, has a larger angle and that is due to <coughs> and that is due to the shorter distance between the, the main gear and the tip of the tail. And this is slide animation for extending of the landing gear in the top and retracting of the landing gear in the back. Human factor with chop. For control arrangement, we decided to go with side stick and instead of the conventional yoke. That is because it does not affect the overall performance of the aircraft. And it also gives the sporty sensation, fighter jet like feeling to it, a modern appearance. And that's why we decided to go with side stick. For the linkage, we have the Gangon linkage with hydraulic assist, and the uh, avionics we chose is a Garmin G3000. That is because of the compliance to the FAR 23 and 25 both. Two primary flight displays, we have one for each pilot, and as you can see in the picture, if we have primary display in front of each, of each pilot seat. Also, we have five multifunctional displays across the cockpit. And it is to be noted that both of the aircraft, S6 and S8, have the same cockpit and in fact, the both configuration. And that is because of the similarity between FAR 23 and 25, <coughs> as well as the 70% commonality requirements to this RFP. Visibility is possibly the most important part of the FAR 23 and 25, but we only have the longitudinal directional requirement of 20 degree on the upper side and 15 degree on the lower side. We have well achieved that with 31 degrees on the upper side with 60 degrees on the lower side as well as you can see. That is on the left picture and for those two other pictures show the lateral directional viewing angles and we do not have the explicit requirements from far but we do have 33 degrees for the outer board from the main pilot and then 10 degrees for the other side. That is the same for the co-pilot seat as well. We have maximum viewing angle of 235 degrees, as you can see by the last picture. I forgot to mention, but we do have adjustable seats so that you can change in the waist your height. For the passengers comfort, we have 5 feet and 6 inches for the cabin height. So if you're as short as I am, you'll be very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, but that is actually pretty average for our plaza's aircraft. So again, we are playing safe on this game, so that, that is very good. The first step comes out at the end of the rudder, and that is uh, eight point eight inches first step. And she looks very happy. 
is a standard cabin layout. We have galley in the front and lavatory, lavatory in the back, both of them are safe for that. But we have storable tables across the cabin, as well as the Wi-Fi is in the standard setting of this aircraft. I'm going to hand off the program summary. Kyle? Thanks, Sean. So currently, we're estimating a $700 million non-recurring engineering cost. This is about 25% of the total expenditures for the budget of the development of these aircraft. The Aria S8 is expected to run a production of 140 with our break-even point after the 110th aircraft. With the X6, a slightly higher number of 200 for the production run due to the decrease in the cost with our break-even point around 152. After we hit the break-even point on both aircraft, we're estimating a $325 million profit over the total life cycle of these aircraft. The table you see is of the profit margin for both aircraft, just over 11%. Our purchasing cost for the Aria S8 at $10.5 million and $8.6 for the Aria S6. The operation cost, which basically includes anything required, uh, pilots, hangars, tie-down fees, anything associated with the ownership of an aircraft, this works out to about $2,100 per flight hour for the Aria S8 and around $1,900 per flight hour for the Aria S6. Currently, we are projected to be compliant with all RFP requirements, key ones obviously being our range requirement, which we do exceed, as well as our Mach number and our commonality between the two aircraft at just over 70%. Are there any questions? Once we've hit 0.8, we do hit that transonic wave drag starts to kick in. 
the increase in that transonic wave drag isn't that much um, until we start hitting past point A2 where it does start to spike rapidly. Um, basically, we decided that if we could take the drag penalty associated with that, it would probably be better to up and cruise at the higher value. Didn't want to push all the way to 0.85 just because that is a very drastic increase, but that's kind of the reasoning behind that. Also, I'd like to add, the eight, 8 is the critical Mach number, but 8.2 is still below the drag convergence Mach number, which is when the when the wave drag really wave drag really begins to, to spike. So we're so we're okay there. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, good job with the presentation. Uh, just a couple of comments about that, and then a couple of questions. So uh, my first comment is I'm. Applaud your selection of a Honeywell APU. <laughs> I'm impressed with your selection of a Pratt. Um, what I would really like to see toward the tail end of the presentation, I saw some uh, technical uh, analytical comparisons between other business jets. I didn't see a comparison at the end between uh, your, uh, your jet and others in the market. I think you're probably aware the biz jet market is very, very competitive. So uh, Dassault and their jet, they're all coming after you guys. Yes. And I would really like to see, uh, let me just give you a quick perspective in terms of, in the competitors in the market, for example, your uh, operating costs. How, how would those, or do you know how they would stack up against so your competitors? Both operating costs as well as sale prices are right in the range of, of the light business jet class. Um, they. If anything, they're a bit more, but that's we we did we get about 20% additional range capabilities in these two jets than is available in your uh, typical light class. So, okay, and um, you can come up with the most technically correct aircraft, right? Can't sell it, you know. I got got some nice notebooks to put on the shelf, right? <laughs> okay, uh, maybe just two questions. So, uh, you. You, when you talk about your design requirements and your FAR Part 25, your uh, envelope for uh, operation is um, indicating essentially or some, somewhere in the U.S., right? Not necessarily kind of in the U.S. Uh, but your range, you're capable of flying transatlantic. That's correct. Go ahead. So we um, we did perform. Uh, some trans oceanic flight. Um, the main requirement we took into account was losing an engine halfway and either being able to continue on or return. Uh, we were able to do that um, in terms of strict range, but we were unsure about other regulations of in terms of things you needed to carry and other regulations to meet, so we didn't present any of that data. Okay, so you haven't anticipated. So you'll probably run into the term EOPS or extended yeah. operations, which is what you're referring to. Okay. Again, for competitiveness sake, uh, your competitors, they don't use maps to just kind of draw over the U.S. and say that's our, that's our available operation, right, to be different. And, and you, you're not limited to that either, right? But there is certification requirements that you have to take into account, right? Okay, yeah. so you got it. Okay. Um, any reason for fuselage, mounted engines versus wing mounted? Do you guys do any trades or... Thoughts around that? Go. So, so the reason we selected um, aft mounted engines, we originally considered in wing engines, that was abandoned very early on, as well as a tri jet and a quad jet configuration. Uh, we ended up going with the standard one because, as Tatiana said in the beginning, it's a very conventional and low risk design. The reason we opted not to hang them beneath the, uh, the wings is, as with most business jets, that raises, you have to lift them higher up, and that affects the tip over angles. Great. Good, good trade-off thought process, right? One more. Um, on your uh, wing structure FDA analysis, you indicated that the overall margin of safety was 0 0.083, so zero, right? Um, now, clarify for me, based on a fact, is that compares you to factor of safety? Did you say factor of safety? Yes, so okay. the max, this is max G load would be 2.9. Okay, I, I missed your yeah. factor. I, I missed sorry, your yeah. factor of safety. Yeah, one point five. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Great. Great job. Thank you. No, I have a backup slide for the trades that we did on the engine configuration. Yes. Yeah, you have a backup slide. 
Right. The thought process going into the trade right. is, is what's important. They did a very detailed trade study on configuration. That's true. Okay. Um, nice work. So much so that I'm just got little things to pick at. So <laughs> I'll pick at little things. Um, Brandt's method for the CL curve. Can you describe Brandt's method for you? Uh, yeah. So we took the 2D airfoil section and then we used our geometry. There's some graphs that you pull the, uh, like, uh, there's an equation, sorry. There's an equation, it's got the CL alpha value of the 2D as well as the efficiency of your wing and the aspect ratio. And that'll give you the new CL alpha value. There's another graph that you can extrapolate where your CL max value is going to be, as well as your angle of attack at which you stall. And then you extrapolate the stall curve. Okay. Brent didn't make that. Uh, I'm not sure if he invented it, but so that's the reference I used. Because just going from 2D to 3D, that's, that's a common Thing. You find that habit fund going on and other other things. Um, I, I just I, I wasn't sure what you meant by Rance method. Ah. And, and I, be careful when giving credit. You, you go out and give a paper in a publication, and, and you credit somebody who did this thing, and it really came from here. Okay. It'll, it'll, it'll not be happy. Thank you. Um, uh, your data plots when you did your, your wind tunnel tests, um, I, I'm used to seeing if it's a theoretical line, that's a solid line. But if it's data, you show data points. Um, it, that's much more common. Um, all right, I, I apologize to others who have heard me say this now in my last two sessions, but I'm going to say it again here. Um, on your thrust available curve, thrust required curves, piece of S curves, your VN diagrams. Uh, what weight is this? Uh, they are at, so sea levels at max, or takeoff weight let, or takeoff weight less, fuel burn on the ground less, takeoff weight, and then at 35,000 feet is the, the initial weight we're at when we're at 35,000 feet, so takeoff minus ground minus takeoff minus climb up, and same thing with 48,000, except all the way up. So, so here's the issue. Um, Plots tend to take on a life of their own. Somebody will take your plot and use it five years from now. And they won't have any idea of what the configuration was because it's not written on the plot. And and so this is this is weight specific. You change weight, you get a different plot. Yes. Um, piece of S curves, the end curves are all that way. And so they you you have to have the configuration on the plot. It needs to be self-contained. Um, that's that's all I'm going to think. Of. Nice job. Okay. Yeah. John, uh, uh, I got here a little bit sooner, so I'm going to preview this a little bit. Um, I'll poke in my area a little bit. Um, structure. So, uh, typical aluminum, aerospace materials. Uh, no no composites at all. Uh, we looked at that, but I mean, again, it's most of it had to do with the cost. I mean, we're looking maybe in a fuselage structure and filament winding, but that process is kind of out of our time frame for our entry into service. Um, on your factor of safety, so your load is 2.9 Gs, is that your maximum load, or is that? Yes, that's a that max takeoff weight. Is that so? Generally, you have a, a a factor of safety for, for, for limit and then ultimate. Yes, we, we didn't run it up to ultimate. So that is that is the factor of safety we chose for. Yeah. You use 1.5 for you. I mean, it's conservative. Typically, you use 1.2 or 2.5. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, so the other thing I on your longerons, on your wing, are those going to be a part of the wing skin or are they going to be attached separately? Those yes, the, those would be like, generated to the skin. Okay. And uh, the skin is a uh, just going to be a, a 
Tacitus or it is, is it is point six two five. Point oh six two five. So point oh six two five inches. And that is constant cost. Okay. And then um, in terms of uh, fuel tank in in the wing, have you considered uh, any what what's your method for fuel sealant and containment? Yeah, a tricky thing. <laughs> so we're thinking of a, a wet wing design, so it'd be integrated into the the wing. Um, I guess you will have to um, follow the standard procedure of sealing that surface. So Not a bladder, but using the actual structure. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to how the citations do it, they seal every rib and hole, every right. uh, access panel, basically. Yeah. All right, you guys. It's, uh, it's amazing to see the work you guys have done. It's, uh, good stuff. Enjoyed it. A couple of slides, comments. Uh, 18. I really like the way you put CG and static market on the same chart. It was really good practice. Number 22, same kind of thing. You had an overlay of the wing on the data, which I thought was just a, a nice chart. Let me put that together. Um, let's look at 49 for a second. Uh, that's, that's maybe not. Um, maybe one before that, 48, here we go. CL beta, CN beta. Um, lateral and directional static stability can be used to give an assessment of certain other modes. You guys know what those ratios are and what those modes are that you can actually get from CL beta and CN beta. So I actually didn't uh, do a direct ratio with those. I did calculate the spiral mode. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of parameters, those are lower down in oh, the table. Okay, sorry, I didn't catch that. That's no, all good. Okay, good. All right, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, uh, number 60. Good job. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> what atmosphere are you uh, projecting your range and payload performance at? What kind of atmosphere conditions? Uh, it's, it's all based on standard ISA standards. Yeah, standard. Okay, so yeah. same with takeoff distance, not yeah. distance. Like yeah. That. Um, did you have anything in your RFP requirements that was looking for off nominal performance, like hot day? Or no, the the performance requirements were at for takeoff was just standard standard day. Standard, yeah. standard okay. day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And you do know that they will yes. change. Right? <laughs> yes. Right. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Number seventy one. This is my last question. Looks like your skin. I'm reading that chart on the on the right there. Your skin is a pretty high stress level. Is that right? Yeah, that's the maximum. Um, is that what you want to do? Do you really want to load the spin on that, or is it just that's the only way it goes? Yeah, no, that's definitely not the goal here. Okay. Obviously, we want the spar stress the most, right. but this is what happened. And again, a lot of it could just become be due to the modeling of the ribs perform. Like I said, this model was fixed at the root. That actually removed the skin. Realistically, it probably should have only fixed the spar. Oh, uh, right. Yes. And also, the load was applied along the bottom surface of the two spars mm -hmm. based on the distribution or okay. to get to the load better as a function. Yeah, it looks like the constraints on the skin is probably not something you want to do. You want to the underlying structure of what the skin flow. Okay. okay, good. Okay, that's all I have. Yeah, yeah good job, guys. It's really cool to see you the second semester. Um, the only thing I thought early on, it would have been nice when you were going over the aerodynamics early, but we could have said that it was your did aero because it wasn't clear if it was your wind tunnel data or if it was your aero, like predicted stuff. Um, on slide 28, you guys went through all your L over D stuff and then you said your crazy mock would be 0.82. And then you never said what your L over D, L over D was at that. So that would have been kind of good to know, just to compare, you know, just to see what the and it happened 10. Yeah, so I mean, it's just throwing, uh, it's not that much, but it's, you know, just nice to actually see that. Instead of saying that you're going to use that, but not actually see what that is. <laughs> um, and the only other thing that hasn't already been touched on, if you go to slide 45, I thought it was cool showing how you validated your twist and by just by showing a picture, like, hey, look, it actually worked. And that, that was pretty cool. So, you know, just nice little piece overall. That was really Great job, guys. Um, I did have a couple of questions about some of the data collections. So, 
first of all, the wind tunnel speed, your Reynolds number, um, I realize you said you size the models to get that Reynolds number. How, what I'm more interested in, I've heard a lot of Astros class earlier say how they chose their wind tunnel speed. I was just curious how you guys chose yours. Uh, yeah. So we wanted to have as much as we could because the faster the wind speed, the higher the Reynolds number. Uh, the way we limited our wind speed was we put the aircraft at a reasonably high angle of attack around 12 degrees at our maximum, and then slowly worked up the wind speed until we saw a wing tip flutter. Uh, that's how we decided we shouldn't go any faster. Okay, that's, that's yeah, so I just want to clarify something. Um, you didn't see flutter. If you saw flutter, you ceased to have the model. Um, <laughs> So you basically ran it up until you saw oscillations in the model, and that's when you saw it. Okay, I just want to clarify that. Um, and then it would have been, I know you showed your stability and control, uh, which you did for that. It would have been nice to see the plots for those because it's good to know that it's stable, but the behavior of it is also very important, and the shape of the curves would be a good idea of that. Um, so one more thing. So I kind of was curious. I I don't know if I spaced out and missed it, but going through your wind tunnel testing, all the testing you guys did, uh, to what what did you find? That did you find anything that you reintegrated into your design? Because you, you, it it kind of seemed like um, the design you had was basically I didn't see any problems you guys found or anything that you changed or did you run into anything that you had to go back and look at or did you kind of just run with what you had or I'm just curious about how the results are reintegrated. Um, we did have some issues initially with our process results. Um, we had an offset in the zero lift and when we went in and looked at some XY simulations of the airflow of the different Reynolds number, lower Reynolds number, it was simulating something similar. And for that reason, we did shift things around to the predicted, basically validating that at the low Reynolds number, we were getting a very similar zero lift angle of attack and a very similar CL alpha from simulations versus the wind tunnel. And so we were basically judging that our predictions were confident, we were confident in our predictions and were able to kind of compare those trends, even though they were slightly shifted. And that's what you see here is the results shifted over to what we would expect to see if we were able to test at a higher Reynolds number. Minus the small regime, obviously that would shift up to the right if we were at a higher Reynolds number. Okay, yeah, well, be, yeah, let's, let's that'd be good to mention, just because like, um, the gentleman said, I forget what exactly it was, but when I see test data that's straight line like that, it kind of raises some red flags, and it was just kind of one thing I was wondering about, but um, it makes sense what they did. Uh, other than that, I think you guys did a really good job. Very thorough design to a level that it's not very common to see it um, at the college level. All the considerations you gave the subsystem. I think you did a great job. Mr. Ashford? Good to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> we have about 10 minutes for the next group to come in. You know that I'm intensely proud of all of you. You have hit this hard for me. Beginning. You have worked together and worked hard all the way up to the end. Uh, they've entered the AIAA National Design Competition, and I frankly think they have a real good shot at doing well in this. And I'll let you know how they do it. I'm just glad somebody said something about you got to show beta. You gotta show your weight fraction whenever you're doing anything with piece of S or just require. So do that. Um, I know you've already looked at the overwater capability. All the things that they mentioned will only strengthen your entry for AIAA. So we want to take this information and turn out next Wednesday. I would beat that up. I just I, I can't tell you how proud of it. You are ready to go to work. You are ready to go.